Okay, let's uh, start. So first, some um, some um, you know practicalities. So we we will try our best to finish lecturing before Easter. I think that's something that is convenient for all of us, I guess. So you won't be doing homework during Easter. I think that's uh, maybe something some of you want, but maybe not. Okay. So we have six lectures. That means with this one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, the deadline for the exercise set uh, five. It will be only five. Okay, no more than that. Probably will be for that Friday. Okay. We already have um, one problem, the second problem, and there will be probably a third. Okay, such that you don't feel like alone. That you know you have, <laughs> you're feeling com you get some company. Uh, so, so let's see. Let's put here. Okay, and that means on the on the twelfth, is it? Okay, there will be only five, only okay, five exercise sets. Remember, they account for forty percent of the grade, and the exam is sixty. Again, you can make very simple the calculation by the number of points over 100. So it's uh, 40 divided by 5. That gives you 8 for each point, for each exercise set. And then you simply multiply by uh, the number of points you got and divide by 100. Okay. And the deadline will probably be for that 12. Okay, So you have to deliver before you go if you are taking an Easter break. Deadline for the fifth. Um, okay, and we are going to have one session after. I will let you know when. But it will be simply just to try to summarize what we have covered in the course, as give you some orientation for the exam. We usually... Um, yeah, participants are a bit afraid of what's going to com come in the exam because you have been working you know, with very complex problems using software, using Excel, so you wonder how are you going to put that on an exam. But if you, so if you go to my website, you will see the, <coughs> for, for that course for, we have now for the last, you know, four years. So you can find First, I will tell you to look at the exam, and usually you have the the regular exam and you have the resitting exam, so you can take a look at what kind of questions are normally given, and also you can look at the exercise to see what kind of things were not covered or we didn't cover too much in detail in this course. Okay, so I will recommend for you know if you want to start preparing or looking for material for the exam, look into all exams and these are both the regular and the reseating and also old exercise sets From all, from uh, from uh, other years, okay. No, that you have to make yourself, okay. That's how you study, right? The exams they have, the exams they have. Usually they have solutions, I think. So let's see here, solution. Okay, but I will say before, instead of going and reading directly the solution, just try to do it yourself, okay. When you you know, it's like you're removing the surprise element, okay? 
if you're watching a movie it spoils if someone comes and tells you he's the killer okay then you you lose all you know all the excitement so just to try to solve it yourself first and then you look at the solution and see what you know what went wrong <coughs> Okay, but we're going to have a session after Easter just to discuss that. Okay, and probably you're also going to get the grades after Easter for exercise set uh, 5. For 3 and 4, hopefully you get it soon, before Easter. Okay, you have the deadline tomorrow, right? For number 4. Okay, so what I thought to... Today I, I would like to close a bit this... Um, uh, the part that we had on uh, flow assurance, okay, which is very important, might not be so important for other kind of for other types of field like uh, onshore fields or platform uh, with dry well heads, but it's very important for subsea fields, and this is a major um, type of fields we have here in Norway, offshore Norway, UK, Africa, Gulf of Mexico. So it's it's a uh, it's very important to take that into account. Okay, so we talked about some uh, flow assurance issues that we have. That was last Thursday. And I also encourage you very highly to go and check. You can check any material you have. Or oh, there are many, a lot of ton of information on the web. Okay, but to start with, maybe you can go to the chapter on my compendium, because that I think gives a good overview of most of these issues and that even though we're not covering exactly here in class that will be on the exam okay so i i recommend you to go and, ch and check that chapter is uh, chapter what chapter it is Okay, because that, that part is ex excellent for making short questions of, uh, you know, hydrate formation uh, conditions, of uh, wax formation conditions, of uh, remediation methods, of how does it affect the field design process, things like that, that you have to explain. Okay, not so much on the calculation. And that will be chapter 7, okay? We try to cover slightly hydrates here in class. Um, you're going to be working on an exercise that gives you more insight into hydrate. Then uh, wax slugging, we are not going to talk too much, but it's in important that you know about it. Um, scale also, we didn't talk too much, but I think also it's nice that you learn about the kind of scales, type of scales we have. Corrosion and wax you're going to have that's the second exercise. Okay, will be on wax calculation. <coughs> okay, so we from all of that, like to make a summary, we have to have a chemical injection strategy and system. Okay, that was one of the conclusions. Many of these problems I have to inject a chemical to make to make it right. Okay, either to prevent uh, the problem or simply to, s to solve that problem. I already have the problem and I want to remove it. Okay. And uh, the thing is that most of these chemicals or a big part of these chemicals, they are not very uh, environmentally friendly. Okay. They can cause damage to, they can cause uh, damage to the environment, they can cause damage to the organism. They can also remain in this, uh, the chain, how do we call it? The chain of, uh, not the value chain, that's, a, that's field development, but on the chain of the chain of life, okay? So, uh, we have to be extremely careful how many amounts we leave, we, we, we release to the environment. And luckily enough, many of these chemicals, they go to the hydrocarbon, the things that are going to be contained anyhow. Okay, the oil you simply don't dispose it to the to the environment, but you carry it goes on a tanker and goes to a refinery and is usually contained. Okay, also the gas. The main problem is when one of these chemicals goes to the water. The water, if we are not reinjecting, we are dumping to the sea. 
then that's something we have to be careful okay and what we discuss is uh, we have a lot of chemicals we inject okay I think we had didn't put it here but where each one of these chemicals is okay and what was the the, um, the category but one thing we have to also you have to make sure you, you have to know is that these chemicals I simply inject and I lose I don't recycle I don't reuse them okay most of them the only one which is different is is meg and methanol which are for hydrate and why is that Be because of the amounts okay the amounts are extremely extremely high because if you see all of them most of them are you know in the ppm level so they are very low concentrations they were 150 50 ppm 200 ppm but when you talk about meg you remember the numbers i gave you on the on this chart okay between 30 and 50 percent on weight that means if i have a liter of water i have to inject a liter of methanol or a liter of meg of this glycol so that represents a, a lot of a, a big cost so if i simply throw that i don't care me methanol or glycol i can it's a green chemical okay so i could in principle simply dump it in the ocean it's a big cost it's like throwing money out of the the toilet okay so i that's one of the few chemicals that i would like to recover okay that i like to recycle to recover from the stream and then uh, use it again okay so let's put that like a short sentence here such as you're aware due to cost And they call it, they use the term reclaim. Okay? At the top side, okay? And remember, this MEG usually goes with the water because it's the water that forms hydrate. Okay? So it goes together with the water but it also dissolves in the water so you have to find a way usually it's like some sort of a distillation process by heating and the change in in boiling temperature that's how i managed to to take it out to separate meg and water so it requires so we say reclaim unit usually we call it a meg or methanol reclaim unit Okay, and uses high temperature. It uses heating to, so it's, it's a unit that uses a lot of energy. And we need, of course, if we think that we are going to be throwing away a lot of money if we simply dump it. Okay. Um, then there was one thing that I I wanted to so. Another thing I wanted to, that I forgot to mention last time, was the chemical distribution unit. Chemical distribution system. Okay. We have all of these chemicals, and they have to be injected in different places. Sometimes emulsion breaker, I use just at the separator. Sometimes I just want to inject topside. Okay, but many times I want to inject at the well level or I want to inject at the pipeline level. Okay, so there are different locations at the platform. Okay, at the platform I can also have corrosion, I can also have scaling, I can also have hydrate. Okay, I want to inject also at well. Okay, that means either at the bottom hole or at the wellhead okay. or I also want simply to protect at pipeline and flow line level okay okay 
and the injection in those two cases they are performed from the platform so far we don't have like a unit people are thinking about it but we don't have a unit sub C that we can use to simply a storage that we can use to get those chemicals okay so far these two are done from performed from the surface or let's say from top side okay and that means that you have to have a line that you have to connect where you have to connect the top side with the well okay or the the location where you want to inject and that by itself is a big big cost okay so you have to put you have one pipe coming from the well up but you have to have one line going from the platform down okay and that's typically performed using umbilicals Okay, and umbilicals, um, I think you see that if those of you taking the subsea production course, is that the name? Subsea production systems course. They discuss, I think, about TPG 4200, I think. Okay, so they talk a bit about that. But basically, I have like a compound pipe that has many things inside. Okay, it needs usually some, it has some flexibility. It has an outer shell that is simply to maintain the integrity of the pipe, to avoid that it will break, that it will separate. And inside it has a lot of different things, okay? But inside, within this pipe, we have this chemical distribution system. We have the facility to send the chemical from the platform all the way to, I'm going to put that here. And it's, it's usually a relatively expensive cable, okay? Because it's not simply a pipe, but it has it has a lot of technology inside. So like in that case, you see you have some power cable, maybe you have a pump, or you have something you have to power. You have some um, signal, maybe from transducer, uh, pressure, temperature, transducer. Uh, you have this usually the big metal pipe, that's the mech because the flow rate is relatively high. And then you have a smaller pipes that they carry uh, other inhibitors, scale inhibitor, can be corrosion inhibitor. And you have also the hydraulic control lines. Okay, remember that the valves, we, act, we usually actuate them with Okay, like in this case, I have a gate valve, okay, which simply, if it's going all the way down to the lowest position, it simply is in line with the flow, and the flow can go through, okay, but if I want to close it, I simply have to pull it up, okay, and then I have to put that part, which is a blank, which doesn't have a hole, okay, simply put it in front of the passage, and then it's, it's closed. Okay, and these valves are usually on and off. The way I control, the way I move that piston, I use a hydraulic line, high pressure, and low pressure. Okay, that's how I, I remotely activate those those uh, those uh, those valves. And uh, depending on the architecture of the production system. How many architectures do we have in the subsea production system? Okay. 
okay remember how we had cluster satellite whales right we have cluster template whales and we simply had satellite whales okay if you remember cluster satellite we had a manifold unit in the center and then we had the whales and between them we have either a short flow line or what we use what we call a jumper right so here we have each whale we have a manifold okay and then we have maybe the line coming up okay or we have one so that's the cluster i can drill from the same drill ship but i simply they are in slightly different location or i can have what is preferred here in norway and also due to protection for fishing is a structure called a template okay in which the manifold is in the center and each well it's okay <clears throat> so if you see for example for that configuration is typically is typical to have a sdu okay a subsea distribution unit okay where i have the umbilical coming inside from the platform let's say okay that's the main umbilical and then is splitting is simply separating that umbilical to all the different places where i need to have where that those lines want to get okay. in the case of the template sometimes i simply come directly with the umbilical with the main umbilical i come directly to the manifold uh, to the manifold module Okay, so everything is a bit more compact. So I think I have some images on that. Okay. Like that's the case of, um, that's a platform uh, semi, what kind of structure is that? Semi-subversible, semi okay, called Njort. Okay, we didn't talk too much. But you see, it's exactly on top of the whales, such that if we want to make any intervention, even though they are subsea whales, they are located in that shape, they can still make intervention with the tower, okay? They can still make intervention on the whales. Also, each whale has their own riser, so they go separately to the semi-sub. That means it's very easy also to test. But you see these two lines that come here on the other side. These uh, are the two umbilicals, okay? And then you have Come here, you have two, like they look like templates, which are these subsea distribution units that they give the distribution of all of these lines to all the different wells. Again, you have two of them. Okay, so that you can find information on that. That's called Njort. And um, okay, and that's how the unit looks like. That day we had the chance. I think it was last year. They took it out. They were going to change it. So they they um, they um, they had it here in Rootwall. Okay, and actually you could go just walking. Just you could see from the from the walking path. Okay, so that's what we call an SDU. So even though it, they are not template wells, so in that case I simply have a SDU, and then I separate. And just before, so you can take, you can look at that and you can see many 
uh, different things, but I think it's better if we see a simpler sketch, okay, to see what exactly is simply a distribution manifold. Okay, so I hit here I put the lines like if they were separate, okay, but actually they come under the same pipe, is that compound pipe called the umbilical, where you have a lot of things that comes inside into this SDU. And inside the SDU, do you simply have a distribution manifold, okay? And remember, for each weld you have, you need a routing valve, just like in a production manifold. So if you need to produce to weld X, then this one should be open. And that's, I don't know if you can see it from here, but I think here you have some of these uh, valves that you can actually okay, open or close. And that's, I think, for, I don't know if that was a high, high pressure fluid. Okay, and you have different valves for different fluids. That in that case is a hydrate inhibitor. You have a distribution manifold, simply a piece of pipe. And from there you have derivations to all the wells you have. So I think here you could connect, I don't know how many, one, two, three, four, five, five wells on this side and on the other side. Okay? <coughs> okay, so here I have another drawing which shows a bit more how the system looks like. Okay, so you have the weld template, then you have the subsidy distribution unit, you have the platform where you have the two separators in that case. Each weld can produce to line one or line two. And then you have from here you send methanol in the umbilical, you distribute it in a manifold, and then it's go and serve all different ones. Another thing which is interesting to see is the point where of injection, okay? In this case, maybe I have found I don't have any risk of hydrate formation in the well itself, so I don't need to be injecting continuously at the bottom of the well. It's enough at the well. Do you see here, I have, what is the meaning of PMV? Master valve, okay, that's the main valve that closes all access to the well, typically it's open. Then I continue here, downstream is where I put the injection point of the methanol, okay? What is the meaning of MIV? Methanol injection valve, okay? And then I have a control valve. Of course, I want to control here, I'm distributing, and I want to be maybe even. I don't want to inject more on one well than the other. So I have methanol control valve, okay? And then I have other things, PW, PWV, what does it mean? production wing valve, I have another temperature transducer, pressure transducer, PCV, production choke valve, okay, <coughs> and then I exit, all of that, now I hear I have either a jumper, a flow line or something, and I go to the manifold, okay, so in that case you can really see just, here you see the umbilical, so here you can see either a short umbilical or you see the separate lines going to, to the well. <coughs> okay, when you have the manifold, I think that figure, we have seen that before, right? But when you have the manifold, remember we didn't want to talk too much to avoid confusion, okay? We were simply looking at the production line. But here now you can see where is the umbilical coming in on this uh, manifold? Remember, we have the four wells on each side. So where are the umbilicals coming in to the, to the manifold? These two here, okay? And you see you have a bunch of things, a bunch of lines, and each color code indicates something, okay? Methanol, scale, corrosion, one is a hydraulic line, and that goes here, you have the distribution manifold, just like in the case of the SDU. And then see, how do I join that with the well? Again, I have another connector where I have not only the main production line going on that direction, 
but all the other lines coming to this area, on this direction. Okay, so that's um, that's what we call a multi. In this particular case, we are using a multi-board connector. That guy here. Okay, that is that is taking everything simultaneously. Okay, looks something like that. Which I take maybe the main production pipe coming from the well, I have the signals coming from the transducers, I have the methanol, maybe injection line, hydraulic power, I have and all of that is made on the same connector. It's a, it's a big connector that contains all of them. And this manifold that we showed before, okay, this distribution manifold, now it, it resides here. Okay? That's why you have too, too many lines. You have the manifold and you have the valves and you have the lines going to each. To each um, okay? And these are, in this case, these are to be activated by ROV. You send a robot that is able to open and close those uh, those valves. And the connector looks something like that. If we make the sketch. So here you have two interfaces. You have exactly the same that we had before. Production master valve. That case that indicates it's uh, you know hydraulic activated CCSSV. So first let's try to locate ourselves, okay? That's the production master valve. So here we have this hanger, okay? The, the, the tubing hanger. So that here, from here down, we are coming inside the well. We are coming on the annular space on the tubing. That is the well head, that will be on the Christmas tree and well head. Here we have another connection where we have the control module. That's because the choke, remember, in the choke, a lot of, there is a lot of dissipation of energy, of pressure, uh, there is a big drop of, pre of pressure. So usually that module, I have to change it in time. So to avoid having to change all of it, I simply put it separately, such that it can disconnect and change simply the choke. Okay? And then I have this other connector, which is with the manifold. Okay. That connector that I have here is actually this connector here. Okay, so from here I come, choke module, then the choke module is connected to the Christmas tree module. And then is here I have the tubing, the tubing hanger. Okay. And you see here I have the line coming out that has a production fluid, but I have the, a lot of lines coming in. I have this one, which is methanol, methanol control valve. I pass another connector here, methanol injection valve. Okay, and then it's injected before the wing valve. Uh, and here I have also the scale, okay? Scale control valve, scale injection valve. Again, it's injected. Uh, what is the meaning of uh, SD? Sun, sun detector? MP, MPM? Uh, you should know, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Multiphase flow meter. PT, pressure transducer, TT, temperature transducer, PCV, production choke valve. Um, and here we have the annular, okay? Remember, we in the well, we don't only connect. When to get a simple schematic, we have our tubing, we have our casing, and here we have a seal. And we are regularly producing through the tubing, but I also want to have access to the annulus for all kinds of reasons. So I have another valve here. So this big valve here 
that will be the production master valve and that's the annular master valve okay so in principle I could also produce okay but just to even though you say okay I just send the lines send chemicals finish it's a big change in cost it's a big change in the layout is a big change in the type of equipment type of connections i i ha i need okay so just it adds a lot of of complexity to the to the system okay and uh, before we leave that this part there is one small thing i just wanted to make the comment that i also have to be careful or i have to be aware of what we call dead legs. Okay, like in this case, let's say from this well, okay, I'm producing up to here, but that well is not producing. Okay, so that well will enter into the line. I will start flowing or continue flowing to the platform. Okay, but then all of the rest. Because they have no warm fluid here. All of the rest, all the way to that valve, okay, is going to be stagnant. It's going to be fluid simply not in movement. It's going to get some conduction of heat through the same fluid that is flowing through here and there, okay? But it's basically going to be a stagnant and it's going to start to cool down. There I could have the issue of you know hydrate formation. That's a point that is called a dead leg. All of that from here to here. Okay? And that's that I took it from, that was from a conference, I think. So you have exactly the same. You have a, a manifold, a header, and then you have different wells coming in. These wells are not producing. Therefore, all the way from here to here is a dead leg. And I have to be sure that I won't have any problem of formation of hydrates of any, any problem here. This part has to be inhibited, has to be protected. So that's also something uh, that is done during the field development process. I have to find out what are the dead legs that I might have, and how do I ensure that these dead legs are inhibited, are protected, even though there is no flow, okay? Okay, that clear, more or less? Any question? Okay, so let's take a break and then let's revisit exercise problem one of exercise set five. Because we, so there are a few things you need to, we need to discuss before such that you can solve completely the exercise. Okay, so let's do that in the second part of the class. But let's take a break uh, first. Okay, so we come back 1.15. Okay. Let's uh, resume our. Okay. So now in the second part, I just want to discuss with you uh, some some things on exercise set um, problem one of exercise set five. Okay, that should be say it should say problem one. Okay, but basically we have again this field Snow White you are getting very fond of Snow White. Uh, the main challenge there, flow assurance in that field, is this long transportation pipe that goes from the field subsea all the way to Melkoye. So the main risk there is uh, you know it has light hydrocarbons. The temperature is reducing. Pressure is reducing. Uh, and you have some liquids, okay? You have some water coming out of solution. So the main concern there is is hydrates, okay? That's what we are focusing on in this problem. So like it says, you have to, just looking at that system, and we are going to see now, it might not be enough. And two, okay? Focusing on that system, simply to look at how pressure and temperature decline with distance, okay? 
Remember, we, we, last class we said, so that's, let's say here, problem one. Okay. We had a hydrate, we had temperature, pressure, and we had a hydrate formation line. And simply we had some pressure and temperature that will be, in this case, at the PLEM, okay, pipeline entry module, and temperature at the PLEM. And we know these two are going to be reduced, and the main question is, if that combination it will cross at any point the hydrate formation line. If it's going to cross it, then we have to make continuous inhibition of, of hydrate. If in this case we are choosing to use either MEG or we're we are using in our example MEG. Okay? I change it in not not methanol. Okay? Or you can use also or methanol. And I told you we are going to use high seas first. It's convenient. We have a lot of licenses. We can use uh, NTNU. Also, it handles very well the phase behavior with pressure and temperature. And it's not very strong on the pressure drop part. Okay, but this can still be a better approximate than using the dry gas. Okay, in reality, it's going to drop. You're going to have liquids dropping, condensing out of the gas. And these liquids, they cause an increased pressure drop, okay, due to two, two factors. One of them is the density. You have a density which is higher than the pure gas. And even if you have a little bit of liquid, that density is going to be significantly higher. And also, one thing is the friction factor. In that case, it's not only the gas who is in contact with the wall, but you also have the liquid, and that causes also uh, additional pressure drop. So that's one of the things I wrote here is that you have to be aware that when we have done our plateau calculations, our production profile calculations, we are assuming a lot of things, okay, dry gas, no liquids, neglecting that, so the results will be, might be different. Okay. So that's why, that's part of the things, if you are developing the field, you should be aware that all of your tools are consistent. Okay? If you are using, for example, Excel, that is consistent with HISIS. Okay? If you are using HISIS, that is consistent with, with GAP, with all the tools that you are using during the, the development process. Okay? So what did we do last, last class? We had a very short introduction to, to HISIS, and we said we're going to analyze the following case. Okay, we have HISIS works with streams. And you can have two types of stream. Material stream, that they contain composition, pressure, temperature, and rate. These three things. So pressure, conditions of pressure, temperature, composition, and also rate. And you can give any rate, okay? Usually molar, all of them are molar rate, volume rate, mass rate. Okay, you define one of them, and all the others are automatically defined. Then after that, I had a process. And the process was a pipe. When we, HISIS is mostly used is for topside for processing systems. Okay, in that case, it's very simple to say every unit has an input and an output, or has some inputs and has some outputs. In the case of a pipe, it's not so localized. Okay, it's so something that can be very long, 150 kilometers, but still keeps the same logic. That is, like if it was a unit, this pipe here, that has something that comes in and something that comes out. Exactly the same logic. But in our case, our unit is huge. Okay, it's, it's very low. So we have made 
something like that so that we said was a plem that we said was a separator and from that process the pipe also is giving something else which is called um, how do we call it is a material stream and a energy stream okay. which is simply heat okay or you can also say it's power and that's also something that is coming out and usually has a different color that is coming out from this pipe the heat that I'm releasing to the environment so in in principle is is very simple okay we just have to compute find a way to compute pressure and temperature along that pipe but we have a few a few complexities so let's open I told you you could run Hisis from farm. So let's try to open that. Okay, it's relatively intuitive to use the interface. And that's also another reason why you cannot find that, why not? Because of the bars? Yeah, I think... Um, Okay, so here that's what we have done. Okay, and, and we are going to go very soon. Why did we have we have we have added you know uh, this uh, wellhead? Okay, but basically the interface was very simple. We came here to properties to define how many components, which components we are going to use. In our case, we define in class only two. Okay, this methane and decanes uh, plus, which is a pseudo component. This is including everything that is heavier than 10, 10 and heavier. Instead of having bringing all of them, I'm using some pseudo components with some pseudo properties to represent all the rest, everything which is heavier than C10. Uh, and here you have the full, so I didn't put the full composition. I should have maybe done it. Nitrogen methane and all of that you can find almost all of them all of them are tabulated uh, components okay so you can simply search them here ethane ethane okay it's here co2 etc then after we define that we went to the fluid package and see how are we going to model this mixture what kind of equation or what kind of model I'm going to use. So there are different uh, choices, okay, but we are going to use uh, Peng Robinson. And finally, that's, that's uh, here you have some additional uh, settings that if you want to tweak the equation, okay, maybe you found in the lab that when you measure exactly that equation doesn't represent very well has a slight deviation so you made some changes in order to get a better match and you can change change it uh, here we're not going to look into that and finally we go back to the simulation okay. so we set up those conditions here 
actually yeah we didn't have that before so we had inlet to the pipe outlet to the pipe that will be empty will be a result of the calculation and then the 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 heat the energy is also a result of the calculation okay now there are a few things that that we have to take into account okay few complexities one of the first complexity that we discussed on friday was a uh, in the plateau period there is a pressure drop across the choke okay and we know you have done it here in class that if we have a pressure drop in a gas that can cause cooling okay and if you have cooling that simply will make it move the point if you're looking at exactly that that will make it even more to the left it will reduce the temperature okay and reduce also pressure so that's why we have added to our system okay so we have our plem which now it will be it won't be any more an input okay it simply will be a result of something then we have our pipe then we have our separator what comes in to the separator we have our heat okay and before that so that's the plem we go back to the wellhead okay remember where we are remember the layout of snow white we have the plem we have the big pipe the separator the long pipe then we have this three wells okay I think there are three but it's not necessary to flow to to have another pipe okay we are just just assuming that from here to here the temperature doesn't drop much the distance is very short so we can say these two the template that I think we call the template this template location Okay. We are saying that the pressure and temperature at the template, they are more or less similar to the pressure and temperature at the plem. So we don't have to solve that part of the pipe. Okay, We don't have to, to solve the flow on that pipe. But we need to solve, we have the temperature at the wellhead, okay, which will be here. We have the temperature at the wellhead and we have the pressure at the well. So for that we add the choke is basically a valve, okay, it's like a valve. Okay, where we have a pressure drop and here we have the wellhead. Okay. Remember the expansion what we have used is isen isenthalpic, okay, so it will go that's the input we pass an isentalpic process we find that pressure we have okay we have measured that pressure we said um no, actually the pressure we don't have right the only thing we know is that de that delta p is 162 bar okay for the plateau period or zero okay and one more thing is that HISIS performs its calculations on this direction. Okay, so I fix the conditions here and it will go one by one. I have that pressure and temperature, have a delta P of 160, find that pressure, and then I calculate the, the pipeline, the pressure drop and temperature drop on the pipe, and I find those conditions. Okay. But we know that the pressure here has to be exactly 30 bar. Okay. Therefore, you already think that you have to make some 
iteration. Okay, you have to make some, you have to guess. So the, the, the workflow will be guess PWH and then HiSys calculates P separator. Okay, and then you have a check. Okay, is P separator equal to 30? Okay, then finish. not then guess another pwh okay. and some of you already told me that pressure actually gives me much higher than reservoir pressure okay but i'm telling you so don't be concerned in we have done it for you know for uh with with dry gas okay so it should be different okay so we are not going to be concerned about that just now Okay, so that's that's the layout I have here now. I have uh, the wellhead, a pressure drop of 160 isentalpic, and then I reach the plem, and then I have the pipe, which I have specified, uh, the diameter, the length, and then I finally end up on the on the yeah the separator. And here we have close to 35, okay? But if I want to be exactly, exactly 30, I told you we can use an adjust, okay? To make that process automatically. Okay, and adjust. So the adjust you find is like a range. You, if you lose the palette, you come here to view palette. And you find this range, which is called adjust. So it's like a solver. It's like a solver, exactly the same function as the solver in Excel. So I click here, I put it someplace on the, on the sheet. Okay. Let me just reduce that. Yeah, and exactly like in the way we do it in Excel, we say adjusted variable. Okay, what am I going to adjust in this case? What is it? The wellhead pressure. Okay, so I select. And now is this wellhead pressure. And then the target, what will be the target variable? Separator pressure, slug catcher, we call it here pressure P P pressure pressure okay and what do you want it to be which value and here we have to be careful with the units okay but it's 30 bar okay and then we have to do some tweaking unknown maximum so here you have parameters what method are you using so you can use different types of method tolerance when am i satisfied do i want 30 or 30 plus minus what okay so what tolerance do we use here let's say maybe 0.1 bar right we are not very exquisite St step size Okay, each iteration I will change the adjusted variable in some increment. What it will be a kind of a maybe we use the same, okay, 0.1 bar. Minimum of that pressure, well, we know it could be 30, right? That's a, we know it has to be bigger than 30. Okay, maximum I have really no idea. Number of iterations, I'm not sure, let's increase it, let's put 100, and then start, okay, and it finished. So here it shows you the iterations it made, okay, change 250, okay, from, so it did 32 iterations, 
let's see what was the starting value 260 all the way to the solution which is 2 250 257 okay okay so that's one one uh, one complexity you already know how to deal with let's go to the number two okay the the wellhead stream must be saturated with water okay we know actually the water is what causing the hydrate problem right and this water where is it coming from gas no gas doesn't have yeah, the gas is dropping out of the gas, but how did it come to the gas in the first place? From the reservoir. From the reservoir. Okay, in the reservoir we have water oh. wetting, typically wetting the rock. Okay, and you have the gas in between, and then with the time millions and millions of years that water starts to go inside the gas okay? and that's stable that gas will be saturated with water at that pressure and temperature which is so the gas is saturated with water at reservoir pressure and reservoir temperature Okay, reservoir pressure, how much was it? I think it's changing, but for the plateau case, it's... Um, 276. 276, okay. 276 bar, and then the temperature is 92. Okay. So we know now we cannot use simply these hydrocarbons that I have here, okay, that I have provided. I have to add now water. has to be one component. And the way you have to make it, if, if we're going to make it schematically, okay, I have the stream from the well, that will be hydrocarbon gas. Then I have a mixer, and then I mix it with water. Okay, all of these will happen at reservoir pressure and reservoir temperature. And finally, I will end up with this which is basically reservoir gas. Okay. So I'm going to add water. First, the water, the mass flow of the water will be zero. Okay. Then I simply get the same gas. Then I'm going to increase it, increase it, increase it, until here I get only, when I start getting the first droplet of water, okay, if I say, if I look at that gas, When I start to get exactly the first droplet of water, liquid water, that means that's the saturation point, right? If I mix it, the, the, if it's very small, the, ga the water will go into the gas, will be uh, in the vapor phase. I add a bit more, still goes into the vapor phase. I add a bit more, still goes into the vapor phase. But at some point, when I add a bit more, then it will drop. It can't take any more water the gas okay so you know how to do it you have to add increase that mass flow until I get here uh, what we call the quality okay the quality of that stream should be equal to zero that means the mass of the liquid divided by mass of liquid plus mass of vapor Exactly when it starts to change, that's when it's fully saturated. Okay. Luckily, in high seas, we have something to make that to make that work for us. Okay, so we don't have to do it manually. Then we will need another adjust. Okay. So we have a unit. If we go back to the palette. We have a unit called. Um, uh, here saturate unit okay which is a unit exactly to do that 
okay, to saturate that stream. And here simply for the example, let me just change that fluid and let me change it to to simply pure methane, okay? Because um, because I will have to add all other components, so simply let me say simply dry methane, okay? Let me then just make small. Okay, let me just copy that stream, paste it here. I will call that stream reservoir. Dry gas, okay. The temperature, 92. The pressure, it's 267. Yeah? 276, 276. okay. Okay, then I uh, have to put another stream out, okay, that will be my reservoir wet gas, okay, or reservoir saturated gas. Okay, that will be exactly at the same temperature, well, actually, that will be a result of the unit, okay, of the saturation process. And then I need to mix that with something, which will be the water, reservoir water, okay? Reservoir with this water, which is wetting the rock. Uh, so for that, I add one more. I have to add, of course, water. So I go back here, components, let's search for water, okay? And it, by default, for all the rest where I haven't specified, it simply will put zero on the water for all the rest where I haven't specified uh, the water. Okay? But this line one, let's call it reservoir water, or how the reservoir engineers want to call it. Huh? Brine? But remember, you don't take the brine with you, right? When it saturates the gas, is that, let's say, the gas takes that water, right? Then later it drops that water someplace. When you, when you taste it, is that going to be salty or sweet water? Sweet water, okay? So it doesn't bring with it the, the brine. So let's call it uh, the salt. So let's call it um, reservoir water. Okay, the temperature will be 92. Pressure will be 276. Okay. And the mass flow, that's what we want to calculate. Okay, how much water we want to add. Okay. Then we add that unit. Hmm? Oh, composition, that's correct. So it will be 100% water. Okay. Then I go to, uh, again, the palette. I find this uh, saturation. Okay, and I say the feed stream will be dry gas. The water stream will be reservoir water. And the outlet stream will be reservoir saturated gas. Okay. And that's how we are modeling that process of adding the gas, of adding the water into the reservoir gas. So if you see here, it's not very significant. You see now the new composition is 0.5%, okay? But that is enough to cause a lot of issues, okay, on the main transportation line, even though if it looks like a very, very small number. Yeah? And after I have that, I have to connect it to the wellhead, okay? So how do I connect it, take from reservoir to wellhead? A choke, okay, could use a choke. Um, 
joke. Yeah, and I simply connect it, inlet uh, here, outlet will be well. Yeah, I have to here to remove the pressure, the, the temperature, okay? And maybe the pressure. Yeah, what is the... Um, No, I think we don't have to use because we know what the pressure, well, the pressure, that's what we want to calculate, right, at the wellhead. And uh, and we have the temperature also. So it's better to use maybe a cooler. Okay, something because I have to bring down pressure, both pressure and temperature. Okay, so let's see if with a cooler goes uh, better. Let me remove this. Uh, cooler and at the wellhead I provide the pressure okay but I don't give the the temperature I also give I know it's supposed to be 70 inlet outlet and I need an energy stream because the cooler is taking energy out. Okay. And let's see on the delta P. Yeah. I thought if I provide the pressure here, it should be able to calculate the delta P. Hmm? So maybe we can try to save. Remember to save, okay? Well, otherwise you lose everything and... Yeah, it's active. Oh, yeah, here I think... The composition, I think I have to delete this. the rate we know the rate we have to take out the rate here okay finally <laughs> okay a bunch of problems so we have to put the rate here and I don't remember what was it do you guys remember what did we use last class I think I have it hmm? Okay, because that's the next challenge we have. So let's say 200 and 200 and something kilogram per second, was it? No. Okay, so I have specified here reservoir and, and pressure conditions, okay, and that rate. Then we have saturated with water, and then we know that that has to go down to 70, and a pressure that we haven't found yet. Okay, but that pressure has to be enough to overcome all the losses through the pipe. Okay, that's something happened here with the negative pressure. Okay, that pressure is not enough now. Um, so maybe we have to increase that pressure. Okay, two, let's try with 280. Oh, but that should be done by the adjust, right? It cannot be, because the reservoir pressure is too soft. So it's, so it's no, but the, you see the pressure drop can be po can be negative, I think. Okay, so you can have here a higher pressure than, than there. 
but I don't know why still we don't have maybe the rate is too high are you sure it was 210? 200? Uh, kilogram per second? Or? No, I'm not sure. Okay. But Did you specify the rate for the residual gas? Or did you specify the rate for the residual Okay. <coughs> so the complexities we have set here, okay? We have, a, there is a delta P across the choke. That means we have to include the choke. The next complexity is the Wilhelm stream must be saturated with water. So we have done that already okay to get our our source water water okay and now the second cha challenge is the third challenge is okay the gas rate is measured downstream the separator okay that means that that rate is not exactly all the gas that is passing through the pipe but actually I have so let's make my model once more I have reservoir gas dry then I have this unit which is like a, like a shower. Okay, then I have my wet gas, wet reservoir gas. Okay, here I put some water. Okay. Then after that I have a process that I use simply a cooler. Okay, I could have modeled the well bore, but you know, I don't need because I have that pressure, which is 70. Will hit. Temperature will be 70. Then I have the choke, will head choke. Then I have the plem, which we said the pressure and temperature conditions are very close to the template. And then finally, I have the pipe, I have a heat coming out I have the separator but then I should measure only the gas that is coming out okay so then for that I should place a separator where I get some liquid which will be hydrocarbon or condensate and water and here I will have the gas and that's the gas that actually I'm measuring okay this is the gas that is 20 million standard cubic meter per day okay so that's another complexity we from I think what we have done last time we said um, the mass flow of the gas will be 20 e, e to the 6 times the density of the gas right I think that's how we have found the, the mass flow at standard conditions. However, that's giving me only this guy. But in reality, you also have that the stream coming into the pipe has other things, has this condensate and that water, which also, so the total mass is the mass of the gas plus the mass of the water plus the mass rate of the condensate. Okay, so what we have added last time was only this this guy. Okay, so for that in our HISIS model we have again to make it a bit more complicated. So we come here with. By the way, you used two hundred twenty-eight cubic meters per second. Last time. Two hundred and twenty-eight. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think we have to increase that temperature, that pressure, maybe 300 bar.
okay? By the way, that shouldn't happen, okay? Here we're saying you need 300 bar to get across the pipe, which is actually higher than reservoir pressure. That shouldn't happen. If we are using consistent models, they should be the same, okay? The thing is that we have used Excel dry gas equation to calculate that drop, and now we are using HISIS, so they are going to be different. But in reality, they should be they should be the same. Okay, then we come and we place now our separator. We should finish soon, right? Then we have two streams. The separator separates two streams. It's a two-phase separator, separating gas and liquid. Slug catcher coming out on the gas. I think I was one. Yeah coming out with the liquid okay, and I call this sales gas or let's call it LNG gas and this will be condensate and water okay. so that's the rate that has to be 20 this rate has to be 20. So let's see if we have, we can find here um, standard ideal liquid volume flow. Liquid volume flow at standard conditions. I think here you have a few more things. The standard gas flow, okay is here standard but it has a different unit cubic meter per hour so uh, how much is um, maybe we could change the unit right but usually that takes a lot of time to change the unit so it will be standard standard gas flow we want to change it to Okay, easy, easy peasy. Okay, so let's see how much we have now. Um, standard gas flow that is and I think that you need 29, okay? that's too high we should have we should have 20 right okay so how do we how do we change that okay you can use an adjust or let's do it by hand okay you you do adjust because i don't want to get into trouble here okay so let's try 200 190 for example Okay, you sometimes have to do some more iterations. Um, yeah, maybe I have to increase here the pressure. Yeah, that's what it's doing. It's adjusting the the pressure, but uh, for some reason, it's not converging on the temperature. It reached a point where the value was um, 37, but for some reason, that maybe I'm using too few increments on the pipe. Okay, but let's see what what uh, with the rate we don't have it here. Let's try with. We can also deactivate the adjust. So how do we deactivate the adjust? Ignore here. 
Okay, and then I set here the pressure to 290, for example. And we are still getting standard gas flow 24. Okay, so we're a bit closer, but we still have to reduce even more. How much did we use now? 180. So you can also have add another adjust. Okay, it's like to having two solvers simultaneously at the same time. So that's we we already reach. Um, yeah. Okay. Any many you should have many questions. Okay, <laughs> I think even I am confused. Okay, but that's a problem when you try to do live exercise in front of you're just looking at me putting pressure. So, okay. But basically, the exercise was not so simple as we saw, okay? Before, last Friday, we thought it was only that part, okay? Then we said we have to include the choke, okay? So that's not so complicated. Then we said we have to saturate that stream with water. In reality, I should have adding slowly, slowly water to that stream. But we have that unit in high seas that makes it automatically for us. And then the third complexity was we have to have the measure rate is actually here. Okay? So what we have done before, we took only that into account to set the mass flow. Okay? But actually we have to take this one into account as well. So for that you can do it manually, increasing that number, 220, 180, 160, until you get exactly there 20. Or you can place another adjust and then solve both simultaneously. One on the pressure that you need to get 30 here, and one on the mass that you need to get exactly 20 here. Okay. But let's leave that for tomorrow so I can embarrass again in front of you, <laughs> do some embarrassment, public embarrassment. Uh, but that's basically the whole exercise, okay? After you have that, you just have to, to do on another point in the plateau, and you have to, to start doing the analysis, okay? But let's leave that, let's continue tomorrow, the discussion, okay?